To give you some background info, we are a group of students and young entrepreneurs developing a mid-scale system with 150 cubic meters of water, four 7 cubic meter fish tanks, and 300 square meters of growing area. With the exception of pumping, our system is fully based on the UVI's DWC approach. Water from the sump is to be pumped into the fish tank and flow through the system by water equalization and gravity until it once again reaches the sump. This means that with the exception of the sump, all the other tanks are placed at the same elevation off the ground. We have three main questions. One, would our plan to use water equalization and a pump at the sump work? The school of aquaponics. So we're gonna answer this first question and then the preceding questions are gonna come after in the video and we'll answer those uh, separately. So let, first, let me get it out of my system. Woo, okay, now we can continue going. So with the first question, would the water equalization and the pump at the sump work? Um, this would work, this system would work. If you have your fish tank in, on the same level uh, elevated as the deep water culture system and then you have the sump tank lower, than the rest of the other systems, then this would work because water is going to travel in the the the, um, the direction of least resistance. And since you have that dip in the in the uh, the water level, then that is where the water is going to travel, even if it's equalized on the other two um, the uh, other two components, the fish and the deep water culture system. So I don't see an issue with that. Um, you just better make sure your stuff is leveled out because if you don't have it leveled out and there's a shift or something like that, and and the water is not going towards the sump tank then it can be problematic and you can have run into some issues there but i don't see any issue with that um that type of setup or you can just place the dwc trough just a slightly lower than the fish tank and that will just i mean that works as well i don't know why it has to be absolutely equal with the fish tank i would prefer to have it slightly lower to negate any further issues that could possibly happen. It doesn't have to be that much lower. It could be a few inches lower. It doesn't have to be significantly lower. Just need, it just needs to be lower. So I would prefer that way just to make sure that there's no other mishaps that might happen or any imbalances in the levels or anything like that. That would be my preferred method. At what rate should the water circulate in our system? Is this a factor of the filtration necessary? How do we determine the size of pipes we need? So let's talk about water circulation real quick. This is a fundamental aspect of aquaponics. It is very important to understand um, correct water flow values and um, the correct amount of flow rate and circulation time that is needed, um, especially for the type of densities that we're using, stocking densities and feeding rates that we're using. So when we're discussing the circulation flow rates and things of that nature, what we're discussing is the hydraulic retention time, the hydraulic retention time. And this basically is how long it takes to exchange the volume of water in a given tank. How long does it take for this? Your tanks are about um, 1,849 gallons each. How long does it take for that entire water volume to be replenished? So I'm gonna assume that you're using a staggered stocking method, a staggered fish stocking method, and you're harvesting and replenishing the fish um, in various tanks at different times. You're not just putting all the fish in there and letting them grow out. So that is the assumption that I'm gonna make when we are dis determining the flow rates for, um, for this particular system. So the determining factors on the amount of flow that's required is going to be the stocking density and the feeding rate. These are like the most, these are the umbrella for everything else because from here you get oxygen demand, how much oxygen is gonna be consumed, how much ammonia is gonna be produced. You get all of these, uh, how much carbon dioxide is gonna be produced. Uh, you get all of these different variables that you can calculate flow rates off of, but they're all determined off of the feeding rate. The feeding rate is the most important thing in aquaponics. So oftentimes what's gonna be the limiting factor is going to be the oxygen consumption uh, depending on how much you're feeding and how much fish are stocked inside of the system. So the more feed that you stock or the more feed that you put in the system and the higher stocking density, the faster the oxygen is, is consumed and the more flow is required um, to replenish the oxygen. And there's formulas and calculations that um, can determine how much oxygen is being consumed um, depending on how much feed is being fed and how much water needs to be um, replenished in order to replace that oxygen amount and keep it above certain levels so the fish aren't suffering and fish production can be um, as, as effective as possible. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna go over the rule of thumb 
and um, this works out very well this so we can save us a little bit of time on doing the long longer formula so the way that we're going to determine this is we're going to take our four tanks and each one of these are stocked with different size fish so that means that they don't all require the same flow rate and same oxygen demand they don't have the same amount so we can apply different flow rates to each one of these but what we're going to do is average out the flow rates and it's going to give us the hydro the overall average hydraulic retention time and the rule of thumb that i like to apply is be anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes of hydraulic retention time the uvi they use 82 and their um and their system but 60 on the very low uh, that's fast fast rapid movement that means every tank is exchanging once per hour so every 60 minutes up to 90 minutes which is means we have an average of an hour and 30 minutes for each um for each all of the tanks to exchange um a as a whole so we're going to use for this example we'll use 90 minutes we'll use a hydraulic retention time of 90 minutes and then we'll work from there so the first thing we're going to do is take our total water volume from the fish tank our total volume which is 7397 gallons or the seven cubic meters and what we're going to do is divide that by the hydraulic retention time that we want which is 90 so 7397 divided by 90 that's going to give us 82 gallons per minute that's what this is going to break down to 82 gallons per minute of flow so with this flow rate here what we need to do is divide that amongst the tanks divide that amongst all of the tanks um and and um provide them in the uh, in the correct proportion that each tank needs so for example we have the tank with the smallest stocking density the first tank we're going to use this and we're going to have a hydraulic re or we're going to recirculate this tank every two hours this is the standard that i like to use every two hours is automatically going to the lowest tank so what this means is we need to find out how much water volume is in this tank which is 1849 gallons and divide that by two because it's two times we needed to circulate two times in one hour so that'll give us 924.5 gallons that needs to be uh, put inside of this system in order for it to circulate uh, uh, once every two hours so we can just divide that by 60 to give us how much gallons per minute that me that that is and that'll give us 15.4 gallons per minute so that is going to come off of the 82 gallons that's going to come off of there and then from here we can do the tank with the largest stocking density this is going to have the lowest hydraulic retention time i like to do one per hour one time per hour because this has the, the largest mass of fish and it's being fed the highest so we're going to give it the most flow rate to replenish the oxygen so this is going to be um one time an hour so 1849 divided by 60 and that's going to give us 30.8 gallons per minute so when we subtract the 82 uh, and we uh subtract um, um the 15.4 and the 30.8 that's going to leave us with 35.8 gallons per minute left so we'll just take that that what we have left and we can um uh, apply that to the last two tanks you can uh, uh, apportion them however you want to um but just know that the tank with the highest biomass is going to receive the most flow out of this the, this remainder so that's basically how you would um go ahead and put the flow rate together for the tanks now in regards to determining the pipe size you really don't have much options so you know how much water volume that you need to pass through so let's say for this example here you have 7,397 gallons total of fish tank um, and I like to get a pump that can at least pump and replenish the whole thing at uh, once per hour even though we're not going to use all of that flow we have it um, uh, we have it uh, broken down to specific tanks I still like to get a pump that is going to can supply enough water volume to replenish all the tanks at least once per hour so that means we need a pump that's at least 7,397 gallons probably going to be somewhere around 7,500 gallons and it needs to include the head height as well so this is including the head height so i need that to pump so whatever the outlet size is if it's going to be around a two it's probably going to be somewhere between two and three inches of head uh, uh, of the outlet diameter that's our pipe size we can't go any more than that we can't go to four inch if it's only a three inch or a two inch um uh, diameter on there that's all we're that's all we can go to now there's ways that you can reduce the pipe size depending on um how much flow rate is going in there but this would be the standard here this would be the standard you're only you're really only supplying a pressurized line in this system to the um the fish tanks that's pretty much where all the pressure is going to so it's you you're just pretty much using the same three inch pipe 
um, if that's what comes on the um, the pump and you're just applying that to all of the tanks and that's it. Nothing crazy about this type of plumbing. And for the outlet, of course, the outlet cannot be the same size as the inlet. So if your inlet is three inches and that's how much is being supplied in there, then your outlet is going to have to be bigger because the gravity does not accept the same amount of flow as a pressure uh, pressurized pipe. Pressurized pipe can push out way more volume in a, in a three inch pipe than what gravity can accept in a three inch pipe. So that has to be considered as well. So this is just the standard way to look at it. I mean, there's other ways to that you can more complicated ways. If you start getting into like fluid mechanics and you start trying to decrease pipe diameters and uh, start considering friction loss from elbow turns and T's and uh, pipe reduction, all that stuff. Like there's ways to determine all of it. There's formulas for all of that. But in this case, it's, it's very simple um, and doesn't require much at all. It's just really a very simple piping coming from the pump. And that's pretty much it. Whatever size that is, that's it. You put ball, ball valves on the end of each of these pipes going to the tank so you can control the flow. You can uh, restrict the flow or open it up to allow more water to seep through. But that's pretty much it. Can air lift geyser pumps completely replace the need for a water pump and blower for aeration? So I've seen people use these airlift pumps for small hobby systems and aquaponics and small um, experimental systems. And even in large pond aquaculture settings, I've seen these used, um, but I've never used one of these myself. So my opinion as far as the practicality of using one of these in an aquaponic commercial setting is, um, you know, is, is kind of limited. So what I like to do is go to the references, the experts that have done and used these things and find out what they have to say about it. And from there, I can weigh the pros and cons and consider if this is something that's even worth my time. Does the aquaponic God want to put time into even using one of these things? Because I know already that the water pump, the standard water pump, that works perfectly fine. So I have to find out if this new airlift water pump was well, actually not new. It's actually old technology. But th does this type of um, exchange for technology, is this even feasible? Does it make sense? And is it, is it even worth it? So let's go through some of the references. Um, I'm going to bring out two references actually three references, but, and then we'll fi figure out if this is something you have to figure this out. If this is something that's worth your effort and worth your time and worth you trying, because you're not going to find any other aquaponic commercial, um, uh, 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 systems that are using this type of technology. So you you're either going to be the Guinea pig or you're going to wait for somebody else to try it first and then see if it works for them. But the aquaponic guide is going to recommend that you don't do anything crazy like that in this type of, especially the size system that you have. You don't have time to be doing anything, trying, trying to reinvent the wheel, but that's up to you to decide. So let's go over and find out what some of these, um, so, some of these aquaculturalists have to say about it. So let's go to my man, Michael Timmons, Dr. Michael Timmons, who is an aquaculture God who has been doing it for over 30 years, who has experience with the airlift pump. Let's see what he has to say about it. This is recirculating aquaculture and it goes as follows. In principle and theory, airlift pumps will by far move the most water per unit of energy supply. He said by far. So that means it's not even a question of what type of pump is going to move the most water per energy. It's not even a question. Airlift pumps are by far the most efficient at moving water for the amount of energy that is required. However, Airlift pumps have the following disadvantages. You see, there's always a kicker. I always tell you guys, there's always pros and cons. I don't want to just hear about the good stuff. I don't want to just hear about that. I need to see both sides of the story before I make a decision. I don't want to hear one side of it. Don't give me that. Give me both sides. Then we can come to a conclusion. So here's the other part of the, um, uh, the disadvantages. Limited application to create water lift or elevation change. Reduction in flow rates due to fouling of the air distribution mechanism, particularly for conventional centered glass air stones. Complete loss of water pumping when water elevation changes cause excessive requirements for water lift. Example, water level dropped in tank where the unit is placed. Reduction of water flow is not obvious to the casual observer. And energy efficiency is highly related to very closely matched requirements between centrifugal blower and the airlift requirements. So these are the disadvantages named by Timmons. Actually, there's one more pro that I found on the, in the next page of the book, and uh, it, we can add this onto the pros list as well. So here's the other pro that can be added on the list. It is 
Airlift pumps have the added advantage of aerating the water in the process of providing the pumping function since air is used to drive the pump. And this is very important. I, I believe this is a good pro right here as well because if you can add aeration in there with the, um, with, along with pumping, that, I mean, that, that's a two-in-one combo right there. And it also contributes to carbon dioxide stripping, getting rid of a lot of the carbon dioxide that builds, in, uh, builds up inside of the um, system, and it adds more aeration. So um, that's a, I think that's a pretty good uh, pro right there um, to add to the list. So continuing on with the disadvantages, Timmons goes back, and then he kind of explains and then gives his conclusion on the airlift pumps, and it goes as follows. All of the disadvantages listed above can be eliminated with effective management, maintenance, and initial design of the overall system. So basically, if you want to get this thing to work, he's saying that you need to design it very well and you need to be a maintenance man, an aquaponic maintenance man. So that is another thing that is going to be added on the list of things that you have to do. Continuing on. Practically speaking, airlifts are problematic. Basically, I don't want to deal with an airlift pump, that's what he's saying. I don't have time to deal with this. There's too many problems and I don't wanna deal with them. If the problems outweigh the benefits, get rid of it or don't consider it, either one of those. In particular, the authors became discouraged with their application because airlifts are constrained to low water head differentials. He said the authors, meaning him and Dr. James Eberling, these are the, uh, the, both of these are the authors of this book, they share the same opinion on airlift pumps, that they don't have time to deal with it, it's too problematic, and it's not their cup of tea. You giving them green tea, and they want black tea, so they don't want to deal with it. So that's pretty much their take on it. We can go to another doctor, Dr. Benny Ron. He's an advocate of the airlift flows, and we can see what his opinion is on it, and then from there, maybe you can it'll help you conclude if this is something you want to add and try out for this application. So here are the enlisted advantages that Dr. Benny Ron has listed for the... Um, the airlift flow and they go as follows one the pump is very reliable two the liquid is not in contact with any mechanical elements three acts as a water aerator and can in some configurations lift stagnant bottom water to the surface of water tanks Woo! ain't those some advantages now i can care less about advantages by themselves i need to contrast the advantages against the disadvantages or else it's all irrelevant. I can care less about one side of the story. Give me both sides of the story, then we can conclude. So let's go to his disadvantages and then you can find out which one outweighs which. And the disadvantages goes as follows. One, cost. Quantity of the air to compress is high compared to the liquid flow required. Two, conventional airlift pumps have a flow rate that is very limited. The pump is either on or off. I don't know how you got to four, but we'll say four. The suction is limited. Five, this pumping system is suitable only if the head is relatively low. This means that you cannot pump these things super high in the air. Like if you have, like this this, this system here would not work from um, the NFT system that we have here. It just wouldn't. It's not pumping water six feet in the air. It's just not happening. Six, because of the principle, a lot of air remains in the liquid. So these are pretty much your pros and cons of doing this type of system. The aquaponic guide is giving it a no-go for the, your commercial setup. I'm giving it a no-go. I'm going to say it's not something worth trying. And even if you will, you can get it to work, especially for the type of setup that you have. I believe you would be able to get this thing to work. But the management and the maintenance, being a maintenance man, is something that you, don't, you want to minimize, especially when you're trying to go for profit. You don't have time to be doing that. And it'd be tr I'd rather go with the conventional water pump that I know is going to work. I may have to pay a little bit more money extra per month, but the convenience is the main advantage of um, having a water electric water pump at this at this particular time. It is the main advantage, the convenience. It's the difference between walking to the store and driving to the store. Like you can still get to the same uh, destination, but two different ways of doing it. So I'm going with the one that's most convenient. And that's the way that I um, approach the situation. The aquaponic God approaches it that way. The maintenance man is going to go the hard route. And like I said, you will probably be able to get this thing to work, man. I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say that you can't get it to work. You can, but I feel like the, the disadvantages do not outweigh the advantages. They just don't. I would just rather have something that's more uh, predictable 
and something that I could, um, I would just rather hook up a, a separate uh, air compression system and supply air to the system. I'll rather pay it with the money versus paying it with my time is basically what I'm saying. I'd rather do that all day of the week. So, so to answer your question on whether you have the opportunity to purchase one of these, or if you have to build it yourself, you can purchase one of these. There's a company by the name of Pint Air. Um, they do offer these. You have to contact them for a consultation and they'll probably manufacture one to the size of your system requirement. And then they'll quote you a price off of that. Um, so that is the, that is one company that I saw that does sell these. Um, but the majority of people that I see, um, they build them, they go out and build them. And there are some instructions from Louisiana state university, um, that I'll provide. And they have a way that kind of just demonstrates some of the ways to build it. Um, and it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty interesting, uh, uh, uh process nonetheless. Um, so if you want to get your hands on something like that and you want to be a pump builder, then that's an alternative option as well. So hopefully all your questions have been answered and you're able to make a decision on which route you're going to go. Um, and I wish the best of luck with whatever route you choose. Um, and may the forces be with you. <laughs>